So I have a question for you. By a show of hands, how many of you as a kid were afraid of the dark? Everyone. <laughs> uh, almost everyone was afraid of the dark. Is anyone still afraid of the dark? Awesome. We have professionals at Rock Point that you can talk to if you need it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know, like, I feel like every, every kid when they're little is afraid of the dark. And I don't know, like, what it happened for you. Maybe it was, like, a story you heard because, like, you go to a sleepover and then your friends just ruin your night for sleeping. They tell you, like, this awful story. I think mine was Monsters, Inc. Anybody see that movie? Like, people think that's a fantastic movie and it's literally awful. Like, I love the movie. I love watching it. But the premise is literally monsters scaring kids in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then they say, we scare because we care. I'm like, about you? <laughs> I'm like, imagine that in the real world, like all of us would be in trauma care. <laughs> uh, it's awful. I don't think I slept for like a week after that. Like I was in bed and I think like a monster was gonna pop out and I was just gonna die. Like that was Monsters Inc. I, I was afraid of the dark. I think all of us are in some way, shape or form as kids. But if we're gonna be honest, I think a lot of us are still afraid of the dark today. Even the tough guys that walk in here wearing cowboy hats and boots. Like there's part of you that's still a little scared of the dark. Like when you turn all the, ho all the lights off in your house and you're like walking to your bed, um, it feels a little weird, right? <laughs> you're like, this is awkward. Cole, you don't think so? No. Um, what about those of you who live in like a two-story house and like your bed's upstairs and then you turn all the lights off on the bottom floor and then you run upstairs away from that imaginary monster that's chasing you. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's part of us I feel like that is kind of still scared of the dark in these little ways. I do that. Like I'll turn all the lights off in the house and I'll go to bed and I'm just be like, you know, this is just weird. I'm just sleeping in the dark. I can't see anything. <laughs> like anything could happen and I was, have no idea what's going on. But maybe you're fine. Maybe you're like Cole and you're not afraid of the dark. Um, but I think innately within each and every one of us, uh, we're, we're scared of being in the dark. But I don't think it has to do really with lights. I think you might be scared to be in the darkness of your bad decisions, the darkness of your mind, the, the darkness of your pain or your circumstances, the darkness of being alone, the darkness of being ghosted by someone you thought you were gonna have a conversation with. The darkness of, you know, being lost. The darkness of losing trust. No one likes to feel like they're left in the dark. But why is the dark so bad? Like, why can't we just embrace it and love it? Like, all, usually all the bad things happen in the dark. Why? Well, it's because we can't see in the dark. When you find yourself in these dark moments in your life, you can't see your way out. You can't see your way out of your pain. You can't see the next step to take. You can't see that people actually love you. You can't see your future. You can't see your purpose. You just, you just can't see anything when you feel and all you see is the dark. So let me ask you, what do you do when you find yourself in the dark? Who do you go to? Where do you run? And how do you respond? Whatever that might be, my encouragement to you tonight is that when you feel like you are in the dark, there is a light that can lead you out. However dark it might feel in your life, there is a light that can lead you out. David says this about God's word in Psalm 119. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Whenever we feel in the dark, all we have to do is turn to God's word and he will lead us into a path because his word is the light. You might feel like you're in the darkest season you've ever been. You might feel like you're far away from God. But friends, the promise is that the word of God will lead us in light. The big idea for tonight, if you don't get anything else, is this. The light of Jesus shines in the darkest of places. The darkest of places in you. The darkest of places in the world. The light of Jesus shines in the darkest of places. In our story today, we're going to see a man who had never seen the light. He, he had never had sight, and he's going to get it. Jesus is going to heal him, and he's going to approach him, uh, and he's going to transform his life. So if you have your Bibles or the Version Bible app, go to John chapter 9. As you turn there or click there, in John chapter 8, Jesus had just gone through a pretty intense meeting with 
the Pharisees uh, and some other people. I won't go into full detail yet. I'll, I'll jump into that here in a second. But in John chapter 9, let's read the first seven verses. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? And if you have a, a highlighter, I'd highlight, underline, and circle born blind. Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Jesus replied, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out, other, other, other translations say, I must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then, this is crazy, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went, washed, and came back seeing. <laughs> it's a pretty crazy story, but I want to give some context into really what Jesus was most likely going through in this moment. In chapter 8, Jesus gets mistreated and mocked. It's, it's not a pretty scene. It's, it gets to the point where people pick up rocks and they're ready to stone him. And so he has to flee. He's telling them, like, I am the light of the world. I'm here for you. I have came to save you. And they just have nothing to do with him. Like, Jesus' whole purpose was to teach these people, this is why I came. I'm trying to get you to understand what I am saying. And all they decided to do was try to stone him. And so I could imagine Jesus literally picking right up after this, walk, being thrown out of the temple and just walking just so dejected. I think sometimes we forget that you know, Jesus was a guy. He's a human being. He's fully God, but also fully man. And I get it. I had a day kind of like that today where it was just like, man, I'm, I don't really want to do anything else. And like, you're just walking along and he ends up seeing something. He sees someone that's been hurting for a really long time. And someone who's actually been in the dark since they've been born. And if Jesus really calls himself the light of the world, this is the opportunity he has to showcase that. But I'm going to be honest. I would be totally okay if Jesus kind of just walked right by. Because <laughs> this is a lot for him to process right now. A lot for him to walk through. But for some reason, he doesn't ignore this man. He sees him. And you, know, you and I, were not blind, or maybe you, some of you are, I don't know. Um, but for the most part, uh, m most of us aren't blind. Um, but all of us have things in us that keep us in a dark place. You know, it might be something from your past that holds you back, or a relationship that you know isn't good for you, or an addiction that you know you need to give up, or a temptation that you need to stop giving into. It might be something that someone said to you a long time ago that just continues to plague your mind. Whatever it might be for you, some things just keep us in really dark places. And we don't think that anyone sees us. Maybe for you, it's like, you don't even really know. You feel like you're messed up and no one could really ever truly love you. My question to some of you guys tonight is like, do you feel like no one sees the pain that you're walking through? My encouragement to you is that you might not see Jesus, but he sees you. You might not see Jesus, but he sees you. If you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus sees your condition. Jesus is exhausted and worn down, and he sees this man. Like, he totally could have walked by because of the day that Jesus was having. He was a dude, and this was a rough moment for him. But Jesus saw his condition. And this man did not inconvenience Jesus. We would think that maybe he did. Jesus might need to be go taking some rest. Who knows? But Jesus was not inconvenienced by this man. And friends, you need to know that Jesus is also not inconvenienced by you. When you need him, he's not inconvenienced by you. He is ready to meet you where you're at. He sees your condition. He sees you. He sees all of you. 
He knows what you're carrying. He knows your pain. He sees the hurt that you've been holding on to for a really long time. He sees the darkest things that you never share with anyone else. He knows the deepest hurts that you've been holding on to your whole life. But friends, when the light of the world Jesus steps into your life, your deepest hurts will never be deeper than his love for you. He sees your condition. He knows what you're walking through and what you're carrying. And ultimately, our natural condition is sin, which is leading us to death. And we all, we've all made mistakes. We've all have regrets and hurts and pains and traumas and worries and fears and anxieties that hold us and keep us in these dark places in our minds. But Jesus sees us. He sees you. The light of the entire world sees what you are walking through in your darkest of moments. And the awesome part is Jesus doesn't just see you. He wants to help you. He wants to heal you. So if you're taking notes, the second thing I want you to write down is Jesus shows you compassion. This guy has been blind since birth. Like, that's crazy. He's never seen the food he eats. He's never seen a field of flowers or a dog walking on the street or the hustling and bustling marketplace of the area. Friends, this guy, he wouldn't have ever seen his own mom's face. Like, he is absolutely in his own category of being alone. He's never seen anything. He can't see like everyone else can. So Jesus meets him and sees him and shows him compassion. So why does Jesus do that? Jesus could have just said, hey, like, I'm going to give you sight. But for some reason, Jesus walks up to him and shows him compassion. I believe it's because Jesus knows something about blindness that you and I don't. Blindness leads to loneliness. When you're blind and in the dark, it always feels lonely. This guy was a beggar. If you keep reading as we're going to later, he was a beggar. He didn't live at home. His parents didn't take care of him. He would have been all by himself on that road every single day, begging for people to give him food, begging for people to give him water, all alone every day, never seeing anyone that loves him, cares about him, and wants him to do better. <laughs> Blindness leads to loneliness. Humor me for a moment. Um, I want you to take your hands, and I want you to put them up in the air, and I want you to cover your eyes, all right? Hands in the air. Nothing crazy is going to happen. Nothing weird, all right? Trust me. We're, we're good. But take your hands and put them over your eyes, all right? Now answer me this question. Can you see anyone sitting around you right now? No. <laughs> Why? Because you're blind. <laughs> you can't see anything. This is awesome to see right now, by the way. This is hilarious. You can put your hands down. That was mostly for my entertainment. But um, when you put your hands up in front of your eyes, you can't see anything. You can't see anyone around you. You couldn't even see the person sitting next to you. Friends, if, if you and I are not careful, we will blind ourselves by our own hands really frequently. By the way that we work, by the people we surround ourselves with by the things that we buy, by the passions that we pursue that aren't necessarily of God, we'll blind ourselves with our own hands and wonder why we're bumping into things like anxiety and bumping into things like bad decisions and stumbling over blocks that never should be in your way. Like, when you're covering your own eyes, you can't see. But ultimately, when you can't see, you're alone. So let me ask you, what's blinding you? Is it your ego or your future or your goals or, or your job? Like what might be blinding you? And if you don't know, ask someone who cares about you and they'll tell you. <laughs> because your friends see your blind spots. They know what you need to change. And if you don't have those friends, that's why we have groups at Young Adults. So that you can develop those friendships. You can have those people. Because you do have spots in your life that you do need to get better in. And people can see that. But ultimately, who's better than Jesus himself at helping you see that? 
So let's look back on how this blind man is uh, washed clean. In verse 6, it says, Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Does this seem like a weird story to any of you guys? <laughs> like, it's not just me, right? I, I dare some of you in this room, the next time your buddy says, like, hey, my eye hurts, just to be like, hey, I got you, bro. And then just, like, start wiping on his eyes. <laughs> don't actually do that. But, like, this is weird. Like, you just don't do that. You wouldn't even do that to, like, your best friend. This is awkward and really weird. So why did Jesus decide to do this? We've seen him multiple times just do a miracle. Uh, he even spoke to people, and, and they've, like, picked up their mat and walked. Like, why is he approaching this man? Why is he rubbing mud on his eyes? There's a really human element to this story. Let's rewind a little bit and think about this story from the blind man's perspective. All right, put, put yourself in his shoes. So Jesus is walking, and he sees the blind man. But the blind man doesn't see him. Why? Because he's blind. And then Jesus approaches him. But the blind man doesn't see him because the blind man is blind. And then Jesus spits in the ground and makes it into mud and then goes to put it on his face. But the blind man doesn't see Jesus because the blind man is blind. <laughs> Why would Jesus use mud? Well, the blind man couldn't see him. He didn't know what was going on. There was some familiarity Jesus needed to use to help him see that, hey, I kind of know what you're walking through right now. Jesus makes his presence felt by using the only thing that this man is familiar with, the ground, the dirt, and the mud. This guy has been sitting here for years. He's begging for food and water. And when it rains, the dirt turns into mud. The blind man has felt that before. He understands what that feels like. So Jesus actually shows empathy in this moment by actually giving him the one thing that this man can actually feel. He relates to this. He knows this. So friends, Jesus meets you where you're at and with what you're familiar with. He doesn't ask you to fully change and then heal you. He meets you in these small details that we can miss if we just stumble over them. So not only is he, he trying to relate to him as like, hey, man, I, I understand like what you've been going through your whole life. There's another thing to this, too. And he's trying to really draw his disciples to this conclusion. Think back to creation. How was Adam created? Through the dirt. He was formed and fashioned by God's hands through the dirt. Adam's name means son of the earth or, or son of the red dirt. Uh, scripture says that from the dust we were made and to the dust we will return. So let me ask you again, why do you think he used mud? What Jesus is communicating to this man is like, I want to wash your eyes clean. But ultimately, more than anything, I want to wash your humanity clean. There's something about you that needs to be cleaned that is deeper than your eyes. Friends, when it comes to you and I, Jesus doesn't just come to save you from a physical darkness or a mental darkness or an emotional darkness. He came to save you from an eternal darkness. So this man goes, and he does what Jesus says, and then he goes and he washes, and now he can see. And this homie just starts walking around, and everybody's like, what in the world is happening? So in John 9, verse 8, he says, his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? And some said he was, and others said, like, no, he just looks like him, which I think is such a funny verse in the Bible. And then the beggar's like, no, that's me. They asked him, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. He's like, yo, guys, I can see again. This homie Jesus just put some mud on my eyes and I washed it off and I'm chilling, y'all. Like, this is awesome. You guys have seen this your whole life? What color is that? Like, I don't know. He's just like experiencing this for the first time. But the thing that he is missing is he can't fully see clearly yet. You might think he can, because his eyes 
have been washed. But he just calls Jesus a man. He says, this man named Jesus healed me. He's not fully connecting the dots of who Jesus really is. Friends, my question to you is, do you want Jesus just for the healing or for the person? <laughs> do you just want him to give you stuff as in your Christian life? Or are you actually serving and following him because he's Jesus? This man, you know, he goes through a process in the next few verses to kind of see, is he really just a man? In verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God. For he's working on the Sabbath, which was a big deal to these Pharisee guys if you read the Bible. Others said, but how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous things? So there was deep division of opinion among them. So this guy can't be a man. Can't just be a man. There's no way. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? I don't know if he's scared or whatever, but he's like, I think he's a prophet. <laughs> Maybe he's a prophet. But the Pharisees don't like that answer. Look at verse 24. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this. Because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. The guy's like, I don't know whether he's a sinner. But I know this. I was blind. And now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? <laughs> this is awesome. Look, I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why? Do you want to hear it again? I'll tell you. <laughs> Do you want to become his disciples too? Look at verse 28. Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple. But we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Verse 30, the man responds. Why, that's strange. <laughs> he healed my eyes and that you don't even know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has ever been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. The Pharisees didn't really like that either. And they said, you were born a total sinner, they, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. This, this blind man who now can see went from saying Jesus was just a man to, well, maybe he's a prophet, to then even going to the point of saying he's actually my master and I'm his disciple. He doesn't use that word, but saying I'm his disciple means that he's now your, who you're following. To then say he must be from God. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament has this verse that he says only God can give sight to the blind. So when he says this to the Pharisees who are Old Testament scholars who know all of it, they're like, are you trying to teach us? Honestly? Yeah, he is. This is the type of sight Jesus was after. He, he wanted to heal this man so he could see. He wanted to heal his physical sight. He wants to take care of your physical circumstance. He wants to be with you in what you are walking through. But more ultimately, he wants to heal the, the eternal darkness that is within each and every one of us and get us to see Jesus for who he really is. Jesus cares about your condition. He wants to show you compassion. And let's see what he does in verse 35. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the son of man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. He didn't know. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. If you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus sends you clarity when you submit fully. You get to see clearly when you submit fully. This guy only had part of it. This, this, his man has washed his eyes. He could see the world, but he couldn't see the full picture. He couldn't really tell who Jesus was. But when he realized Jesus was the son of God, the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for, he believed him and worshiped him and called him Lord. 
true sight in this world is believing, worshiping, and fully submitting to Jesus. It's believing and worshiping and fully submitting to Jesus. These next three verses I'm going to read to you are really where it's going to become your decision. This story has been about this man, but now it's going to kind of turn into your lap. Then Jesus told him in verse 39, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, are you saying we are blind? 41, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Do you think you can actually see? Or are you tricking yourself and you're actually blind? Are your hands in front of your eyes and you're doing exactly what you feel like you are supposed to be doing? But you continue to stumble and wonder why life isn't clear and why things happen to you and you're like, I don't understand it. Well, friends, you get clarity when you submit fully. Jesus helps you see when you submit to him. You see, this, this blind man had to go and wash his own face to be healed. But friends, Jesus took that burden for us upon himself. Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin, so that he might take a cross that was meant for you and I. And he died a death that we deserve so that three days later he could raise from the grave with victory in his hand and say, hey, come and live with me forever in heaven. He says, I am the Lord. He died for your sins and rose from the grave so that you might be able to run away from the eternal darkness and step into his eternal light. So my question is, can you see? If you can't, what is holding you back? What's in the way? Because Jesus sees your condition. You don't inconvenience him. He's not like your earthly father. He's so much better. You never inconvenience him. He wants to be with you. He wants to know you. He shows compassion on you and he wants to help you see clearly past this world and into the next one. He cares about your current circumstances, but your current circumstances are temporary when you follow Jesus. Because eternity is in our grasp, friends. And that's the light he wants to take you to. So what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for to take that step out of the darkness and into the light? Some of you need to fully submit. Maybe you have before, but you need to do it again. I heard the number one problem with young adults in the church today is that they're okay doing what they feel like is enough for them without fully submitting to the plan God has in their life. Are you submitted to his will, to the Lord, which means he has authority over your life? Do you live in the way like he has authority over you? Like you want to please him, like you want to do his will. A man who was born blind that got sight would for sure do that. He would want to live for him. The one who gets to see Jesus would want to do that. My friends, have you had that moment in your life where you went from not being able to see, trapped in your despair, trapped in your loss of hope, and then finally got hope given to you and a sight for the future that you couldn't create on your own? The only way we get that, friends, is if we see Jesus clearly through submitting to him fully. He's the Lord of our lives and he has good plans for you. He has a life for you beyond your wildest dreams. So I wanna give you an opportunity. If you've never fully submitted to Jesus, you'll never be able to see clearly. Even when things happen in life, they have a purpose. When you can see a vision and when you can see the future, that vision gives your pain purpose. 
Perseverance through trials becomes a joy. I think some people think there's, Jesus couldn't love me, I've done too much. I'm too far gone. I've done too many things. And friends, the same way you walked into this room tonight, it's the same way he walks towards you. And he's like, nah, I see you. I get it. I know what you're walking through, but I'm here. I just want you to let me have you. Come home with me. So do you want to declare that Jesus is, really is who he says he is? With your life, do you want to live out a life of worship because he deserves it every day, every moment? Will you submit to what he has for you? My question to some of you in this room, I want to ask you, for those of you who have never done it before, do you want to accept Jesus as your personal savior? The one who took the cross for you, the one who rose again, do you want him as your personal savior? If that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I'm going to invite you to allow this light to come into your dark heart. So what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes. And for those of you who want this kind of light, I want you to repeat these words after me. And friends, if, if you believe in Jesus, I want you to repeat these words so that our friends who are saying this for the first time don't feel alone. Repeat these words after me. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. You are the light of the world. You died in my place because of my sin so that you might get to know me. Today I commit my life to you. You deserve my worship. You are my king and I am your servant. Lead me to love people. Empower me to spread the gospel. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you mind raising your hand so that I could see it? Congratulations, that is so awesome, man. That is so great. Other people in the room. It is so awesome and I'm so proud of you guys that prayed that for the first time. Because heaven rejoices when one soul comes home that was lost, more than the 99 that are already there. So as we celebrate, friends, this is an incredible moment. I am so proud of you. And for those of you that raised your hands, stick around young adults. <laughs> this is a great place. We care about you and we want to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Now, for those of you who prayed that prayer for the first time, and for those of you who would consider themselves Christians. God has given you a job to do. He, he sees you and he shows compassion to you and he wants to help you see fully, but it's not enough to just have faith. He gives you a job. Think about this. Each and every one of you in this room is here because at some point you were invited whether it was a friend or social media or you just heard about it some way, you did not get in this room tonight without something or someone telling you. If you're a Christian, you owe the opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to someone or something that invited you to get into church or get into a relationship with Jesus. Jesus tracked you down through someone else's invitation. They shined their light to you. Verse 5 of this said in John 9, it says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And friends, Jesus is no longer physically walking around the world. So who's the light of the world? It's you and me. He says in the Sermon on the Mount that you are the light of the world. It's like a city on the hill that cannot be hidden. So don't take your light and put something over it. Don't cover it. Share it with people. Spread your light to those you come in contact with. You were invited. So be inviting. Invite people. When you invite someone to young adults, you're giving that person an opportunity to completely change their life. 
And God wants you to do it. He's asked you to do it to your local church, to this ministry. He's asked you to live an invitational life because the light of the world is now in you. So what are you doing with your light? Where is it shining? In physics, there's this principle that light can only shine and be seen in two different locations. One thing has to be luminous and create light on itself, which is Jesus. Then something has to be illuminated which is us. And if you were to shine a light on a mirror, it would bounce on a wall somewhere. Friends, you have been illuminated with the Holy Spirit, with the gospel. My question to you is where is your beam of light going? Or have you turned it off? Because God wants to do things in the lives of people here in this room, here in your churches, here in their lives. He wants to use you. As you walk out of this room tonight, it might be too dark, but I think it'll be light. As you walk out, above the doors, there's this sign that says max occupancy, 943. So the amount of people that could stand in this room is 943. I want to ask you a question. If you, and I want you to answer these things out loud. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that he has the power to change lives? Do you believe that God wants to use you? Do you believe that if God wanted to overflow this room through your obedience, he could do it? So why not? Why not let this be something that drives you? calling it Project 943. <laughs> and I want you to join my project. Not because 943 is a number that I want to hit or something that I think would be cool. But why do we not live an invitational life if we believe these things about God? That we might be able to invite people into this space to be like, God moves on Thursday nights. The gospel is presented on Thursday nights. Your opportunity to bring people to Jesus. Why would we not do that? It's the easiest way that someone can come to know Jesus. You know, 82% of people would say yes to your invite to come to church. 82%. The only problem is that 2% of Christians actually invite to church. If you want to see God do incredible things in this ministry, it's not going to be because of me. It's not even because of me, our worship team. It's going to be you inviting people into a possible relationship with Jesus. Thursday nights are going to be a time where I come up here and at the end, we're going to present the gospel. We're going to have moments where people can offer themselves to Jesus and be saved as his, to have a personal Lord and Savior. That is what the goal of Thursday nights from here on out are going to be. And if you want to be a part of that, be inviting. Because you're in this room tonight because someone invited you. Why would you rob someone from that opportunity? Because you feel awkward. I love you and I care about you. And I really believe that God wants to do this through you guys. So I want to give you a couple ways you can do this. The first way is just randomly asking someone or asking your friend, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? On a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Have that conversation and then invite them to young adults. Or invite them to your church. I don't care. Live an inviting life. Second one. Just ask a question. Like, hey, are you religious? If you don't know, just randomly talking to someone on accident. Like, you bumped into someone at Target and it's, like, really awkward. And you're just like, hey, are you religious? <laughs> Have a conversation. See where it goes. And then invite them to young adults. <laughs> invite them to church. This is the simplest thing I can ask of you. I'm not asking you to give money. I'm not asking you to serve even. I'm just asking you to live like Jesus really changed your life. 
live an inviting life. Because Jesus did. Jesus had a really hard day. Jesus would have wished that he was heard when the, he told the people that he was the light of the world. But instead, he was thrown out of a temple. And he stumbled across someone that needed him. For those of you who are Christians in this room at some point, that was you. And now the cool part is, regardless of how your day is going, as you're walking along, you get to see people that really need Jesus. So bring them to Jesus. Live an inviting life. Project 943 goes into effect today. And if you want to be a part of it, live an inviting life. Invite with everything that you do. Invite with your words. Invite with your actions. Just invite with your all. And do it with your all. Because the person of Jesus gave everything to you and is simply asking you to just do the same. We get the opportunity to really just reflect on everything that he did for us. Before Jesus died, he took his disciples up into an upper room. And he, he got this bread out and he got this wine and he broke it, which was a symbol of his body that was going to be broken. And then he poured out the wine and they drank it as a symbol for his blood that was about to be spilled. And they didn't really know what was going on and they were all confused. But later they understood. And so what we do in these moments is to allow ourselves to reflect on what Jesus wants us to reflect on. I have a couple things that might help you out. I want you maybe to reflect on if you're fully submitted. Is Jesus really your Lord? Does he get to decide how you live? The second thing is maybe you just need to reflect on where are you shining your light? What people can I be inviting to? Or maybe you need to reflect on who you need to share the gospel with. But ultimately, friends, reflect on the sacrifice. Because when you reflect on the sacrifice, day in and day out, and you invite people in, the max occupancy of 943 young adults that could sit in this room, it'll happen because of you. Do you wanna see that happen? Do you wanna be a part of a change? Do you wanna see revival come into your home and into your area? Well, it starts individually with you. I'm not trying to get your performance, I'm just trying to get your obedience. So let's be people that live an inviting life. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna pray. And then I'm gonna ask you to go whenever you are ready to take communion. It's gluten-free by the way, so don't worry about that. <laughs> take it when you are ready. You don't have to take it if you do not want to, but I'm gonna pray and reflect on some things. Lord, we love you and we thank you for who you are. God, you have put a direction of obedience in front of each and every one of us. Each and every one of us who are saved has been given sight. Lord, help us not lose it. Help us be people that live an inviting life. Help us be people that want to see our community change who want to make it possible that 943 young adults could fill this room all because they have been changed by the light of the world, which is you. But as we walk through this earth, God, would we reflect on your sacrifice? Would we reflect on who you are? And ultimately, would we reflect on what we need to do while we're here on this earth? Lord, we love you and thank you.